to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to Talent Optimization with Tracy Shirk. Today, we're talking about both recruitment and retention that specifically impacts and what are some key ways to do that. So with me today, I have Tobi Aguna. Did I get it right this time, Toby? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And so what we're talking about is specifically how do we, you know, keep the best candidates that we have specifically when we start talking about inclusion and diversity work. So Toby, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Tracy. I'm excited. Yeah. So Toby, you've had a pretty amazing path to where you are right now at Chessie that has taken you both from some amazing team sports of playing basketball into, you know, some careers at Accenture into starting your own business and, you know, winning a competition with Guy Raz. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about your pathway to where you are now and why, you know, diversity and inclusion is so important to you. I guess from the very beginning. So I was born in Nigeria. My parents moved us over here when I was four years old. I grew up in Clemens, North Carolina. I uh, went to school at UNC, where, as you mentioned, I played basketball. I walked onto the basketball team my senior year. After graduating, I moved to Boston, Massachusetts to start a job as a management consultant at Accenture. I was at Accenture for about five years, three years in Boston, a year in New York, and then a year kind of between North Carolina and Atlanta. But as I mentioned, I am a first-generation Nigerian immigrant, and Accenture, for all the good work that they do for DEI, really struggled with kind of representation. And I just consistently found myself and my sister, Dumebi, who's my co-founder on Chezzy, also found herself to be the only Black person, or in Dumebi's case, the only Black woman in the room. And I think around 2019, we just kind of like stopped and asked ourselves, you know, like, why is this still happening, right? Like, why are companies spending billions of dollars on DEI, and why are job seekers saying that, you know, they want to work for workplaces that for companies that represent their values and be in workplaces where they feel included. Why are we still facing these these problems? And we just kind of wanted to set out on a path to create a platform to solve these problems, right? So we launched Chezzy. Initially, it was Diversify, and then we kind of rechanged, rebranded to Chezzy in January of this year. But Chezzy is just a platform for diverse job seekers to figure out, to find careers that they love by learning from the experiences of people that identify similarly to them at a prospective company. And then we also offer retention solutions for to companies to help them retain the diverse talent that they have via their employee resource groups. So yeah, we've been working on it for about a year now, and I'm sure you have you know more questions to come. So that's kind of just like the introductory kind of backstory. Awesome. So thank you so much for that. And what is an employee resource group? Right. I probably should have said that. Employee resource groups are, I think the easiest way to put it is kind of like clubs for people of shared identities, perspectives, backgrounds, or interests. Most often, companies will have an employee resource group for people of shared races, genders. Often, you have like a black one, a woman's one, an LGBTQ one. You might have one for veterans, people with disabilities, et cetera. But often, I've, I've talked to a couple of companies that have like employee resource groups for working moms. I spoke to a company that has employee resource groups for people that have side hustles, right? So it really can't, it's just generally a community of people that have a shared interest and perspective and want to come together to kind of have a safe space to talk and share secrets, share best practices, events to grow community and network. Right. So I love the idea of employee resource groups. And I'm going to name, I've been a part of organizations where we've tried implementing employee resource groups and it's gone really, really bad, really, Mm. really fast. So Mm. I'm super curious, what are some of those key things that, you know, are almost the guardrails to a positive employee resource group experience? And what are some of the red flags as to, hey, when these are not going well? I mean, I I think... The foundationally ERGs should be open. Although you might have a woman's ERG, you should encourage participation for men, for example, or people that don't identify as women, because it's much easier for a group of non-identifying people to understand the the social issues and the challenges that women face or what the people of whatever group face if they're exposed to it. Right? I almost said that people can't know about it unless they're exposed to it because but then that puts like the onus on women to teach men about women's issues and I would would never say anything like that 
And I'm going to circle back around to that because that okay. is something that I think we should be talking about. In this yeah, segment, so. right. So one thing is just getting kind of open participation and open the ability for anyone to participate in the ERG. I think the second one is just measuring, right? I think what happens too often is that ERGs are just kind of a company establishes them, they check the box, they can say that they have ERGs to talent, they can put it on the website that we have employee resource groups, but most companies don't really have a way of knowing even who's in what ERG, let alone what kind of events are working best, who's the most engaged in ERG. Again, employee resource groups are intended to create kind of belonging community for Black people, for women, for people with disabilities, et cetera. And it's much harder to know if that's working if you don't know who's in what ERG. So just some kind of measurement, some kind of form for actually tracking membership, et cetera, is a requirement. But I think the last thing, or one of the an additional thing is just kind of sponsorship, right? I think the it's much harder for an ERG to be able to request budgets and to draw attendance in meetings and things like that if management, if leadership at the company isn't bought into it. Most ERGs then, as a result, have an executive sponsor that kind of is the liaison between the ERG, the ERG's leads, and the big time decision makers at the company, right? So like if I'm an ERG lead for the black ERG, I can go to my executive sponsor and say, hey, we need a thousand dollars for a to bring in a speaker for our Black History Month series. And that executive sponsor can then take that concern or that that request up to leadership and say, like, we need this, we need this money, here's what it's for, et cetera, check the box, and then I can then they can come down and kind of tell me that it's been approved. So those are the, the the big three things I think that make ERGs the best practices, at least, or some of the best practices that ERGs can have. Right. So if I'm selling an ERG to my executive team. How do I sell that in a way that I can tie the benefit of this ERG will have a positive impact on our business results? It's twofold, right? The whole purpose, I think that what's top of the mind for every company right now is recruiting, is diversity recruiting. What's second of mind, and probably even getting close to, to first of mind, is, is retain, retention, keeping the talent that you already have. Employee resource groups, are, again, are intended to be communities for Black people for women. And they're ways for me to kind of connect with other people at the company and make me feel like I belong there. Right. If I feel like I belong there, I'm more likely to stay at the company. So they're at the, at the very core. ERGs are retention tools, but they can also be excellent tools for supporting your business, right, and growing your business. Which I think is something that leadership is actually really, really missing out on. I recently spoke to a company. They are a fitness wearables company, and they they actually work with their black ERG to make sure that the pro- the product works as well on darker skin as it does on lighter skin, right? And that's a direct business impact, right? If it works as well, if it doesn't work as well on darker skin, it's going to be hard for them to sell it. But if they can test it with their ERG and kind of confirm things, then they can actually market it that way and, and you know, build ads and things that kind of reach out to different audiences. Another example, I, I think that Pinterest Black and Latinx ERG created Pinterest like board, con- I'm not totally sure how Pinterest works, but they created like board content for, right. you know, the Pinterest community, the Pinterest users based on the Black experience, based on Black culture, based on Latinx culture. And again, that like kind of that engagement with ERGs and your product development is just one example of how ERGs can really, really support your business initiatives and not just be resources for, you know, retention. Right. Awesome. So what I'm hearing you say essentially is ERGs are a solution for helping to create an inclusive workplace. Yeah, at their very core, they are that. But I mean, they can be business resources as well. And I think that's something that a lot of companies kind of miss out on. Yeah, I love that example that you just gave because that's so incredibly important is what does this look like at the end of the day and how does this drive both our sales and and our business results? And so when you look at ERGs, one of the ways that I've seen in my experience with ERGs, and we did it a little bit differently because we had some failures with it, right? But one of the things I love about failures is that they are the best springboard to success, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) As long as we learn from them is, you know, inclusion is so much more than conversations. But one of the things that we really started to dig into was what does this culture actually look like? And what are some things that are different? So when we did our Christmas potlucks, it was, all right, so tell me about the food. Tell me about the traditions. Tell me about, you know, so changing Christmas to holiday, right? Or some of those other things. So Toby, how exactly do ERGs impact culture inside of organizations? Yeah, I think if you if you go back to what I was saying about ERGs being open, right? So the women's ERG accepts participation from people that don't, that don't identify as women. It impacts culture because it exposes those people that don't identify a certain way to the experiences, the social issues, the challenges, the culture of the community that they're engaging with by joining the ERG, by participating in the ERG events, by speaking to members of that ERG. 
So for example, I think at last, last June, I was still working at Accenture and we had a lot of just kind of after George Floyd, we had a lot of like safe space venting sessions, basically, right? Where, I mean, it was like two or three hours, very emotional, where different Black people from the company would just kind of get on, like go off mute and talk about their experiences and the company, good, bad in between. And it was eye-opening to me that so many non-Black people were on the calls, at, like saying, like, I had no idea this was going on, right? Because I was kind of like, how are y'all, you know, because I'm so wrapped up in my own Black experience that I was identifying with a lot of the things being said. And I think that that kind of exposure into the Black experience for non-Black people is huge. And that's exactly as I think the, the, the African-American ERG at Accenture kind of held that event. I think that is exactly the kind of exposure that you need to start seeing those changes to culture, right? It's a lot easier for me to understand the challenges of, of women, of people with disabilities, of the LGBTQ community, of veterans, if I can get exposed to their experiences and learn from the stories of the people that identify that way at my company. So that's kind of how they change cultures, just like by opening people's like world view into the different perspectives out there. Thank you so much for that. So I want to go back to one of the questions that we had at the beginning, which was you had made a comment that essentially stated, hey, I would never expect a woman to, to tell someone else how to be a woman, right? Mm-hmm. So, so help me understand, and I'm just super curious, you know, ERGs help with the exposure of it when the conversation's already happening versus the distinction of I'm expecting you to tell me what it's like to be. Right. Go into that a little bit. And I'm going to butcher the quote, but... We do a blog series called How to Be an Ally, and we did one around gender identity. And one of the people I spoke to, they used a quote like, I feel like maybe you can't expect the the, the traumatized or you can't expect the victim to create solutions to cope with their own trauma, right? It's the the responsibility of the people that have caused the trauma to fix the solution. And that kind of goes along what I was saying and just that it's not a woman's responsibility to teach me about the plight of being a woman. It's my responsibility if I want to be an ally, if I want to be an advocate, to go out and learn about that plight. Can I, like, should I be able to ask questions, right? Should I be able to, like, identify, I, I, I do this all the time. I go to my sister and ask her if I have a question, if there's something I'm not sure about when I'm learning about the woman's experience, the female experience, I can go to her to ask her. And, I, and she's kind of made herself available as someone that can kind of teach me. But she has no obligation to do that. If one day she was like, listen, go out and learn it on your own. Google is free. I'd be like, you're right, I'll go do that. But she's, you know, made herself available. But at the same time, I listen to podcasts, I read books, I watch movies, I watch TV shows, I watch documentaries, whatever. It kind of exposed me into the female experience. And I think that kind of, that's ultimately what allyship looks like. It's being active and intentional about wanting to learn about the experiences of the different communities that maybe you're not a part of, that you you don't identify with and finding ways that you can support those communities, right? So I think that I learned pretty early on is that women oftentimes get like spoken over, right? Or don't get the acknowledgement or recognition that they deserve when something happens at work. So I try to be very intentional, especially when I was at Accenture. It's less less so now because it's only myself and my sister. But when I was at Accenture and I was working in a bigger team, I try to be very intentional, especially if there's a woman on the team to say, oh, thank you, Sarah, for creating these slides for me. Or thanks, you know, Jane, for taking notes during the meeting, like really, really giving people their credit that way. And then if I was, if I did, I know that women, they get spoken over very often, right? So anytime that I did accidentally speak over somebody, I'm, I try to be very intentional and say like, oh, I'm very like, you know, before I even continue my thought, I'm like, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Like you can go ahead just to make sure that, you know, I do see them. And I try with everything I have not to do it more than once in a call if it even happens the first time. So I think I only know those things are because I've been very, intentional about trying to learn about the plight of women and, and reading different books and that sort of things. And that's kind of what like active allyship looks like. Not to like, you know, pat myself on the back. I think that's just my my responsibility. It's something I should be doing. So right, right. And thank you so much for that. Because what you kind of just shared was consciousness that these things are happening. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, one of the other things I heard you say is that there's or I'm reading between the lines a little bit, but I mean so often we're not even conscious of the impact that we're having based on who we are or, or what we're given. Right. So in the employee resource groups, then being able to be a part of that, where you can listen into some of those conversations is an active part of understanding another culture and, and hearing that in a one-to-one way, whereas, because sometimes Google lies to you and sometimes TV shows aren't accurate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely think so. I think that the best way to learn would be to like just have somebody you can ask a bunch of questions to, right? right? But that's not that's not realistic all the time. So I do think that 
you know, a good alternative is books and, and, and Google and stuff like that. But the more you can just actively engage with that community by attending their events, by commenting on discussions that are happening in the Slack channel or the Teams channel or whatever, the better off you'll be and the more like authentic your experience, your learning will be. Yeah. And one of the things you said about your sister, and I just want to point this out because I think this is really important, is the fact that she has agreed to be that person for you to ask questions to. You didn't assume that she right. would just be that person. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think admittedly, I don't know that I have asked, but I, I do <laughs> think that she I think we're at the point in our relationship where, you know, if it ever if I was ever asking her too much, she would just be like, yo, go on Google or, you know, right. go go right. talk to somebody else. I'm not in the mood for this. But she's also just been really good about like calling me out when I am missing something, when I am not being the ally that I should be. So I mean, I, and I think most people have someone like that in their life that was, that is willing to kind of, I don't want to say again, be their coach, but someone that is willing to help them as they go through their ally journey, their allyship journey. And it's really just about like finding that person and like thanking them anytime they do take an opportunity to coach you and to kind of teach you or make you a better ally and not letting, not making them repeat themselves, right? Like if they tell you right. something that you should be doing something, not, not questioning it, just kind of going with it and, and, and moving on with it. Yeah, absolutely. And so much of the ERGs and the inclusion we've been talking about comes down to relationships, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it really comes down to the relationships and the trust. And when we talk about, you know, teams inside of a work environment or being engaged in our work, it's, do I trust the people I'm working with? Mm-hmm. Do, you know, do I feel like I can work here and feel good about the work and that I'm valued for what I'm doing. You know, a lot of times in an ERG, ideally, you have participation from all levels of the organization, right? Like there's senior managers, but also analysts. Great part about the ERG is being able to network as an analyst, especially at a bigger company with another member of the ERG that's maybe a senior manager and kind of be your advocate that can be your coach and like help you as you progress through the company. You know, that's another piece of, you know, not necessarily directly tied to that kind of bubbles up into retention because it's helping people with their career and like professional development. So again, it's a great, great point, Tracy, is like another example of how ERGs can kind of support the business and and be these ultimately like great retention tools. Awesome. So a lot of our clients and our listeners are from smaller organizations. So we're talking about like 50 to 250 employees. And mm-hmm. how, in your experience of building ERGs and, you know, really taking this expertise on and the tools to do this really well... What are the differentiations between ERGs and much smaller organizations, let's say, you know, less than 250 employees and, Mm -hmm. you know, the very large organizations of the world? Yeah, I mean, ERGs, I think, are the smallest company I've spoken to that has ERGs is is like 108 people. Fewer than that, like generally, you know, if you're at a tech company with 100 people, you probably only have, like, you would be probably doing really well if you had 10 black people, right? Mm -hmm. If you had... So you generally just don't even have the numbers to really, really formulate an ERG. What often happens is that like, you know, if you have those 10 black people at a hundred person company, they probably have their own like private Slack channel, right? So that like informal ERGs are already happening. Then maybe they plan like their own kind of happy hours, their own virtual social events, et cetera. And I think that that's a big difference. It's just that like an, a small company maybe has ERGs, but they're just not officially called ERGs. They're just like the black Slack group, right? As you get bigger, as you get more people in the company, as you get more people looking to like network and it gets a little bit harder to know the names of everyone that you work with. That's when like the formalization of an ERG and trying to make it into like a business resource. That's when it kind of comes in handy. But for smaller companies, I think you can get the same impact, right? The, The feeling of belonging, the networking with people that identify similarly to you. It's just harder to like formulate it as an employee resource group. Awesome. So as we close every one of our podcasts, it's what is one key takeaway that you have for executives listening into our conversation today? I think I might have said this earlier, but the, the focus is way too much on recruiting, way too much on recruiting. I feel like uh, so many companies are trying, they're doing it backwards where they're trying to recruit and not focus on creating the environment to actually keep the talent that they're recruiting. It's basically mm-hmm. like trying to fill a leaky bucket. It actually needs to be backwards. You need to uh, reverse. You need to focus on retention. And again, a great way to do that is via employee resource groups. And then from there, you can go on to recruiting, right? And it's, it's going to be a lot easier for you to recruit that talent if you can point to the things that you're doing to like keep the talent that you already have in those interviews, in those, in those applications, et cetera. So that's my one thing for takeaways is just like focus on retention first, focus on keeping the talent you already have, focus on like creating that inclusive workplace. And then from there, the recruiting will be much easier for you to do. 
Absolutely. And very timely considering where we're at right now. Right, with the right. Things. The first step for DEI is establishing stuff, posting jobs on, on diversity recruiting platforms and, and launching your ERGs and launching and, tra- and getting trainings in, et cetera. But the next step is really knowing the impact of those things that you're doing, right? What's measured gets managed. And it's very easy for you to just kind of launch stuff and forget about it because you have no data, no stats, no metrics or KPIs around the success of those programs. So for employee resource groups, and this is kind of like the benefit of the, the Chesi ERG dashboard is just being able to track who's in what ERG, how many events the average person is attending, what the net promoter score for the kind of events that you're doing is, et cetera. And like the ultimate goal is based on the data that you have, right? You'd be able to say that people that are in employee resource groups or people that participate in our training programs are, or people that are in our mentorship programs or whatever kind of DEI work that you're doing, people that participate in our DEI efforts are 30% more likely to stay at the company than people that aren't, right? And then it's a lot easier for you to go to leadership and say, we need more money for this DEI work because it's directly right. contributing to us retaining the talent we have. Absolutely. And tying it to performance sometimes too. Is right. To that also works. That, that are actively involved are our highest performers. Mm-hmm. And that's an easy win, right? Because mm-hmm. we know that, that they're more productive and profitable and engaged for the organization. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you're interested in learning more about Toby and what he's doing, you can find him at Chazzy. And I do have his LinkedIn and his website in the show notes. So you can follow up with him there. So thanks so much for joining us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.